Hello, hello. Welcome to Crypto Testers. I have with me here uh, John Patton, one of the busiest guys in the crypto space <laughs> at the moment, founder of Treasure DAO, which, in my opinion, is one of the most interesting projects at the moment, especially if you like layer choose a lot like I do. Thanks for being here, John. Of course. Yeah, I was in, a, I've followed crypto testers since the beginning. I was in your Solidity course on Telegram. Uh, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That one never really took off, but no, it's helpful. I hear so yeah. yeah. Okay. Nice. Nice. Good to know. Love to begin this podcast by talking about you, sort of your, your background. When did you get into crypto? Yeah. What did you do before Treasure DAO? I got into crypto in 2018 as an investor. Um, I had heard about it in grad school back in 2011 and laughed at it. Bitcoin. I even convinced my poor roommate that it wasn't going anywhere. And then I didn't hear about it again uh, until the massive run up in 2017 and started looking into it. And it, it was amazing. Just even projects that never took off the ground, like Grin, I found really interesting. And then I just dove in. At the time I was working as, as a statistical analyst. Past summer, I went to work at Osmosis, which is a Cosmos-based AMM chain, and I work in growth there. And then in September, when the loot craze happened, I co-founded Treasure, been working on that along with Osmosis. And you're still doing Osmosis on the side? Mm -hmm. uh, Treasure has a, has a really big staff. I kind of just help with like strategic priorities and things like that. Uh, okay. Really talented group. Let's maybe recall that whole history or, or like the the, the origin story of, of Treasure DAO, because I remember it, it sort of happened at the same time as loot came about and all the loot derivatives, I remember missing out on, on loot and having massive FOMO and then <laughs> minting like all the other loot derivatives, like Treasure was one of them and then Dope, uh, dope Wars or something. Okay. And so I, I, I think you could stake them, these Treasure NFTs on L1, get some magic. Right. Anyway, I completely forgot about it. In December, it resurfaced on, on my Twitter but suddenly, you know, Treasure DAO was a huge community, a huge vision, and it was something much more yeah, tangible uh, suddenly. Uh, Let's talk about the, the whole loot period, what your views on that and its significance for the space, and then yeah, how you got to eventually build something real out of it. Uh, like you said, it was a significant thing in the space. I'm from a DeFi background, but I had gotten more into NFTs over the past couple of years and had been trying to build a decentralized marketplace, you know, and you've probably noticed this also coming from DeFi, very few of those mechanisms have trickled into NFTs. And when Loot came around, it really struck my interest because a lot of the things that had been missing in the conversations about decentralization had been pushed to the forefront. So if anyone's not familiar with it, Loot was an NFT that was a black card that had five, or eight randomly generated words on it. They corresponded to um, different types of adventure gear. So it was just randomly distributing the tools to build a game with. And, uh, you know, I've said this before, but so Ethereum is a, a mechanism that doesn't have a context. It's a general purpose blockchain and loot functions the same way, where it's just an invitation to other builders to come in and take these things and see what can be constructed on top. It sparked this giant craze, this mania. It was fascinating to watch on Twitter, partly because you saw people, you know, disparate groups of people trying to build together for the first time. And it didn't really work because there wasn't a social coordination tool between them, like how they ultimately made decisions, what they were even deciding. And to me, it was bigger than uh, gaming. I didn't really play many video games growing up. I actually just read a lot of science fiction. And, and, and that's what I liked about loot was it, it, it appealed to me in that sense. And so when we saw it, I, I realized, okay, this is kind of like, if we just did this with resources instead, we can start building out the framework for decentralization, starting with the metaverse, but then it could build larger DAOs. Because that's functionally what these things were on Twitter, like the divine robes groups and things like that. They were little tribes that were forming around NFTs functionally as their governance tokens, but they just didn't have any way to make decisions. So we said, okay, if we use resources instead, worlds will blossom around them, and then they will use these resources to connect. And um, economic activity is what will turn these things from just little fantasy games into actual economic assets, where people are using their imagination um, through community storytelling and um, interlinking these narratives to build very vast, complicated incentive structures that function like real economies. It, we sort of toiled around for a while. It wasn't getting much traction. Magic Token was intended to sort of a cross metaverse money where we allowed people from Loot, In, and A-Gold to come 
and treasure to farm it. The idea being that there would need to be something that just denominates all these things happening. And also there needed to be like something to power decentralization in NFTs. Like I think mm. the way most people think about it is that centralization is something that has to be torn down. But decentralization is something that actually has to be built. Like you have to have resources for developers and there has to be like this momentum behind it to continue adding new products bringing in new builders, staving off centralization, which is the norm, not an aberration. Yeah, so Magic, um, uh, what eventually ended up happening was we had this very simple thesis that this is what the metaverse will look like. Here's its potential to create these mega DAOs that can not only build brands, but they can actually build, or they can orchestrate builders to start creating massive decentralized products. And then we just waited to see if any would come around. It was like um, lightning in a bottle where, you know, we had the former head of graphics at Netflix volunteering for us after a couple months and oodles of developers until we figured out how we could pay them through the uh, 1KX deal, um, which um, gave us runway um, and also magic um, doing better as a token. We've been able to like um, find more ways to divest. But yeah, yeah. so so we brought this amazing community came around and just took this really simple idea and started started proving it has legs. I'm I'm really grateful yeah. everyone. And the the treasure NFT was that even your product or your initiative or did you literally just come and invited people from you know the A gold community from uh, I think you mentioned one other project and and the treasure NFT holders to come and say hey. You stake your NFTs and you get this new resource, this this magic token, or were you actually the one, yeah, that uh, launched these treasure NFTs as well? Yeah, I I launched the treasure NFTs. I think I because loot is such an easy to use smart contract template. I think I spent 30 minutes on it. It had spelling errors in the uh, original cards. I would go back and choose different resources, um, but we launched it and just um, I sent it to some friends, and I guess it probably pumped, it popped up on Nonsense and then took off. But with magic, it was more a deliberate plan. Like, look at all, there's all these communities that are vaguely doing the same thing, but there's nothing connecting them. And they're also missing the same thing, which is a social coordination tool. You know, that's what I learned from DeFi is that fungibility yeah. is extremely important. The token is incredibly important. So we just, we just added the missing piece. And it's a, it's a good name for a token as well. Thanks. Um, it looked really yeah. silly with a less than a million dollar market cap. And now that it's like gone up more, yeah. people are like, that's a good name. So it's funny how that changes. And um, yeah. And then, so you, you say you launched a token. Um, I remember that was on L1, uh, simple UI with some staking contracts and you could just get magic. Most people just believed it was worth nothing and just, I guess, dumped it or something. But uh -huh. And you, you're saying there was, behind all this, there was a community shaping with some really talented people. And, and so yeah, at, at what point did you decide, for example, to launch NL2 and And how, what was Bridgeworld? And we're going to talk more about Bridgeworld uh, later, I guess. But was this then, did you first just think this would be the only game or, and then others came about? Or how, how did events took place once you had this magic token? Well, yeah, just to start on the community piece. So we launched the magic token and didn't even really have a clear idea of the tokenomics. We had a vague idea. But this guy named Garp, who's a co-founder, he came in two weeks after we launched. Um, had this amazing vision for what the emission modeling should be. Like um, he was the one who came up with our large ecosystem fund, which generated a lot of the runway and is now how we can kind of like seed investments into partner projects. And then after GARP, we started bringing in um, front end developers, um, back end developers that I guess had just farmed magic or saw it and thought it was interesting. And they just really took this project to another level. It's amazing. I mean, even the game. So Bridge World itself, a guy named End pretty much designed how the whole economic structure works. And we gave him a basic scaffolding, but he just went crazy with his imagination and brought back this incredible thing. And uh, I've destroyed all the documents on what Bridgeworld was going to look like before he came in. So no one ever has to see those, but he did a, he did a fantastic job. But so, so with your question, like we actually tried to be very patient in creating a game because it was very clear that loot wasn't, whatever loot was, it was much bigger than a game. It was a meta game happening where people were like coordinating together and actually engaging in economic activity, or that's what we wanted treasure to be. So we wanted to be like a cradle for lots of different types of games and even platforms, communities, DAOs. So we didn't like, you know, I, I've been kind of guarded about trying to, to like pigeonhole our economic structure to like one auto battle or something like that. Cause I do think it's bigger than that. Like, um, 
you know, Treasure is now starting to pull in partner projects that um, already have established communities and visions, but they are just linking up with the treasures, which was our original vision that, you know, this can eventually swallow every other metaverse because it, it, it connects them. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And um, what would you say were the biggest, like looking back, the biggest factors for yeah, the success in attracting such a community? Because for I had a friend yesterday, he told me one of the reasons he, he bought magic is that it, it's, it's such a like cult. You have like, a really special community and and you're saying like really early on some exceptional people contributing yeah. and i think there's so many projects in the space that are struggling to attract community uh, everyone knows it's it's the key to success to really scale without you know centralizing right. power at the same time i guess it's also it brings about also like issues right when you just cooperate with with randoms that you don't really know yeah, um, that's hard. At the same time, it can it can, yeah, create issues. But yeah, how how did that work out for you so well? Well, I think the loot playbook was pretty genius and a bottom up approach to community building. And um, you know, I have so much respect for Dom for what he created. He's also been very nice to me behind the scenes, helping mm. treasure and giving us ideas. Um, I, I think it was unfortunate for loot that he is kind of a pseudo celebrity. So on one hand, he came up with this like great blueprint on how to build a community that is leaderless. And on the other hand, you have someone who like just gets pulled into this cult of personality because people are like amazed at how successful he is. And we didn't have that problem because I was an unknown builder. All of us were. Um, so it let the token just um, be at the forefront and the community. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm self-aware that I was like an unknown builder. So I didn't have any problem getting out of the way of a more talented person who came in and they were coming in with like amazing skills and building things on day one. So we just, we just decided to, yeah, let the community run it basically. And it is difficult. I mean, a lot of your day one collaborators, you know, when you're an unknown builder, create months of problems later. And it's just one of the most frustrating parts of the space. Um, you know, we've dealt with that. We've, we've mm -hmm. narrowed it down to a group of people that if um, a lot of integrity are not here for the right reasons, but you know, I mean, it's uh, fair launches are, are um they're trying uh, it's it's difficult yeah, i think that's another really interesting aspect that you just touched upon uh, with with treasure is that you this is you know what what got me really interested in in december when i started reading your tweets you have this view of really inverting the the normal model of launching nfts where um you know just projects uh launch launch yeah these pfps or whatever whatever the nft is and then people mint it at 0 0.1 0.2 ETH, and basically the the project owners are rich by the time the project has minted out or sold out and there's no real incentive to to build anymore obviously there's exceptions some some teams are really good and continue building but you are sort of inverting this model and doing only free mints uh, and yeah. So you're really incentivized to keep on building because the only way you're going to have revenues and not by you, I don't mean you personally, but like the treasure DAO is going to have revenues is through royalties. So yeah, I think that's, that's a really uh, cool view. Do you have anything else to share about that or? Um... Well, I think that, yeah, um, I appreciate that you saying that that came from being in the space for several years, just seeing there, there really are two kinds of people, not to be cliche. There are people who see the long-term value of the stuff and are building a long-term scale. Um, and then there are scammers who are extremely effective at making a lot of money very quickly. And, you know, you have to be very deliberate about the kind of person you, you want to interact with. And the NFT mania was, um, you have a lot of people who came in and noticing how every rich everyone was going to get. So the formula was incredibly easy to deploy of just promising people all these things and then getting their ETH and cashing out. Um, so the free mint model to me, it was just like, this is the way the space has to go because, you know, ours was a little nuanced in so far as we only charge in our native token also. So mm -hmm. our native token started a valuation of $0. So did the NFTs. And so we created a marketplace where you can only trade with magic. Um, so if people thought our economic output started to have value, it would be reflected in the magic token and also the prices of the NFTs. So we tried to sort of like simulate a small nation state um, that was trying to create value to its native money. And I just think that the Fremont model over time, you know, it's incredibly good at catalyzing a community because you have people who started at the bottom. Um, and I do want to say like um, to the treasure and, and smalls people like 
because in some ways it's bad. It kind of creates a rabid community when people make that much money. So like, I think we should focus on, you know, staying polite and positive and, and not, yeah, becoming toxic or whatever. But, um, mm. but you know, it does align, align everyone, the community and the builders yeah. with a long-term vision of what you're making together. I feel like it also invites the community to then contribute because they feel like they got something gifted. Whereas, you know, the other model where, yeah, you're more like a customer and that's like a, exactly. a project, you, you pay them money and then uh, you expect them to yeah build stuff for you but there's no real yeah community forming around and for example i, I can see this already with with battlefly i'm sure we're going to talk more about it later one of the upcoming games uh, it's really the community is designing a lot of the nfts already like for example my community crypto testers we designed our own own battlefly and that granted us like 75 whitelist spots that that we raffled among the community but so like really early on already so people can get involved very early on and um yeah it's definitely a game changer you launch an arbitrum is there right. any specific reason that uh you, yeah you launched there was it only the yeah the only general purpose layer two available at the time um or yeah are there other strategic reasons because For example, there was Polygon as well, where many games decide right. to launch or, or Gnosis Chain. But um, yeah, curious. Yeah, so there were two main two main things there. Well, just besides like Arbitrum is an amazing um, piece of infrastructure. It's incredibly secure. You get all basically all the benefits of um, layer one security, given the fact that it's rolling up on chain. And um, so that, you know, Arbitrum is a fantastic thing and they have an amazing team that helped us the whole way. Um, Nina and size Chad and um, Hunter um, that, yeah, they were great. So, but the two main reasons besides Arbitrum, you know, being good, good technology is uh, the first is that we consider ourselves a DeFi protocol um, from the beginning. Like this was going to be an infrastructure play where we were building out the piping for whatever the metaverse would end up being. Um, and a lot of DeFi protocols were moving to Arbitrum. And the second was that, um, We knew it was going to be difficult, but like our plan was pretty ambitious to start building out infrastructure. So going onto an island where, you know, there isn't an NFT or maybe there is now, there definitely wasn't at the time. There was no way to like, unless you knew what you were doing to get an NFT to Arbitrum. So we could, and we were going to, we were creating an inventory from scratch and um, our thesis was different than other NFT or metaverse communities. So we wanted to just be on an island with this kind of fragile concept where we could start like attracting users from L1 without worrying that our inventory was going to ever leave. So it really just sort of like um, allowed us to collect all this energy. And then mm -hmm. some an accidental thing that happened that's really nice is that, you know, it you'd be hard pressed to think of an example in crypto where there's a money that isn't the native token of the blockchain. I, Ohm and Temple are really the only ones I can think of. But in every mm -hmm. other context, like the work that goes into securing it or the skin in the game is what gives it the money like quality. And then people price everything in it. Um, and we didn't think about this at the time, but you know, Arbitrum doesn't have a native token right now. And so our idea was that like, you can actually make a form of money that um, is backed by imagination because you have all these people putting work into figuring out how these things link, really fine tuning the incentive structures. And then on this, um, infrastructure that doesn't have its own native token, like ours could be pretty easy to um, simulate how people price things. Because once you go to Arbitrum, you're, you know, you have to use AETH and all this. And, uh, but um, you could just as easily price everything in magic because th there's hardly anything to do there except what we were trying to build out. Yeah, yeah. at the time, that was certainly true. Now it's starting to, uh, yeah, they're starting to be, Oh, nice I meant in the NFTs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, But, oh, yeah. Yeah. At the beginning, like with NFTs, it was because there wasn't an 1155 viewer. That's true. That's true. Yeah. If if there had already been an OpenSea and other players, uh, probably ETH or would have already been sort of accepted as the NFT money. But because yeah. you built on a yeah, um, and we wouldn't have been able to because we take five percent royalties, and that's our flywheel. Is we charge in magic, and we get. 5% of every transaction back. And then that doesn't go to the existing team. It just goes to grants to new builders. And so 
you know, it allows us to be very purposeful about who's getting the native token and that they're aligned with our long-term vision. It also just creates the momentum for this thing to go mm -hmm. from, you know, zero, zero dollar market cap to whatever it ended up going up to. Yeah. And was it hard, um, given that you were the first on Arbitrum, I'm, yeah, I'm no expert in this, but did you have to build out a lot of the infrastructure for NFTs yourselves? Uh, because yeah. I know on, on L1, you, you know, there's so much composability P people use, you know, for example, the OpenSea API for, to display images and so on. I, I imagine, yeah, a lot of this infrastructure was, was missing on, on Arbitrum. Um, was that right. challenging? Yeah, it's definitely challenging. And people, you know, uh, I love that uh, the word people used was the treasure marketplace looks raw because it, you know, it was very, we were building it as as we go and we could only build so much infrastructure. But now with Trove, which is going to be our general marketplace, we're building our own API so that all of the like things that is just on L1, we'll have our own version of. Yeah, it, it, like everything that um, yeah, Treasure DAO has built, all the interfaces look very very particular like I, i i really dig it but it's so different to like the normal design but it has a, it really has its charm and it makes it look very grassrooty i for me Thanks. the question will be like as you as you grow whether you will try to you know adapt into a more like mainstream brand but i can also imagine that yeah the current brand really fits also the the gaming world quite well so But yeah, it's, it's cool to, yeah. to hear that Trove will have a, a different look and feel. And I want to talk more about Trove as well in a bit. I would love to dive a bit uh, deeper into the, the three main games um, that, that you guys... Or is it even correct to call them games? Is that how you... Yeah, I, I think so. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, to, I would really like to um, you know, dive deeper into them to make this all more, more tangible to the, the listeners, the viewers. So I have the um, yeah, uh, founder himself walk me through the user interface here. Um, so this is, this is basically the gateway into Bridge World, right? Which is the, the right. first game that you Correct. designed, right? All the others came later. I'll admit that I have not really... Uh, played it myself just because of the lack of time. I just started before uh, this podcast. I, you know, bought like a, a recruit legion that I bought here for 10 magic in, in this barrack. And uh, yeah, kind of just uh, freestyle, but would love to hear um, from you what, what the, the vision with Bridgeworld is. Whoops, I was on mute. Yeah, sorry, I was just pulling it up. These kind of function as tabletop games right now. Um, I... Um, someone mentioned that that's what they they reminded them of um, to me, and I thought that made a lot of sense the other day. Like they aren't like actual games yet; they're more just kind of like resource accumulation, um, yeah. and then item item updating. Um, and honestly, that's all crypto is anyway. That's what people love about it. It's just one giant resource game. But you know, yeah. we just, we distributed the resources, which are treasures, and then also these NFTs. So when you could farm magic. People who farmed magic and then migrated to Arbitrum received these characters called legions. So what legions yeah. do is they go and they go on quest to earn treasures. And then those treasures that they can use for different purposes. So what they're going to be able to do soon is crafting these things called harvesters. Um, and harvesters interact with um, the magic mine. And the magic mine is sort of like the center of what um, the uh, bridge world is and also just sort of like treasure in a larger extent um, you can go take your nfts your legions and also treasures and then the equipment you're going to be able to, to 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 craft and then you go in and you can earn magic so it's like this um this yield yield generating asset um our money and um so right now we're just um distributing yeah more of distributing the items until the game gets larger and it'll have a spatial mm -hmm. component with land so these harvesters you'll be able to then build legs and move them um, across um, across mines, um, and then it'll be a strategy game where you know we're going to add a sense or a degree of randomness to where the magic ends up going. So guilds will have to make decisions about like where where to take their equipment, um, guarding against randomness, and um, we're also going to we're also so it starts in bridge world, but we're gonna also going to add small brains and other ones. So they're going to be able to play like capture the flag with the harvester to take over controlling 
the magic mining for a period of time. And we're trying to do this the most decentralized way we can, where like the community kind of gets to decide the parameters for these things. So we're being very intentional about structuring the metadata across all of our projects to be pretty similar. And that the level of work you're putting in to upgrade is pretty similar. Because then at, the, at that point, these characters really are cross metaverse and they can be like raiding each other and cooperating. And um, yeah, so Bridge World is kind of a meta game. And the really, really cool part is that the community has brought all these DeFi protocols that they're already built on top of, not just guilds, but um, I'm reading every day about projects that are um, paid mints, but then they take all of the money and just lock it in the magic mine forever to reduce the circuit circulating supply of magic and then create constant yield for the DAO, which is really neat. I didn't think that, I didn't see that as something that people would use, but we wanted we wanted the mine to function as a base layer for um, basically fantasy DeFi. So you, you mentioned the the legions, you can send them on, on quest. That's one of the main activities uh, today, right? And then right. They, they come back with treasures and these treasures have some real economic value. Uh, you have a marketplace uh, yeah. which yeah, we're not going to open now, but they have some, some value and some, and so like, are you gaining these treasures based on how powerful your legion is? Because I know that you have different classes of legions, right? There's like the numerators, the, the rivermans, and then like, right. I have a, like the most, the cheapest one, the recruit, um, but how, what impact does it have on what sort of treasures I, I bring home after my quest? Yeah, the, it, it determines sort of like the difficulty of quests you can do, but most of the quest is like, uh, is just um, randomness, like like your result. But, um, you know, in the future, it'll be more nuanced, like types of quests um, you can go on will depend on the character. And we really want the community to build out more things too. Um, you know, the initial goal with the treasures was that in the same way that people were forming little groups around the divine robes, we hoped that they would do it around like team Grin and Team Honeycomb, which they kind of are already doing. But for right now, it's it's a, a pretty simple. There's like yield multipliers in the mind based on treasure, mm -hmm. and um, you know there's a limited list of things you can crafting. But hopefully, as the economy expands and become way more nuanced. Uh, and the the main reason that these treasures that that you basically obtain, as we said before, by uh, sending your legions on on quests, the main reason they have economic value is that uh, they have a multiplier effect on uh, magic that people can stake uh, in, in the mine, right? That's right. Uh, and they have different multiplier effects. So if you get like a, a rare treasure and, and stake that, then you might get like, I don't know, times 1.5 what you would normally uh, get, like the, the normal APR that you would get, you, you can right. like multiply that. Okay. And so, so obviously yeah. people, yeah, if you're if you're gonna sell a treasure and it has like a high multiplier effect, people are gonna pay for that. It's right. Kind of pure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's a so, and there's a reflexive relationship between magic and treasures, where you know you need you need these legions to go earn treasures, and then treasures yeah. can be used to craft items to earn magic um, in the mine. But um, the magic mine has to be like powered up, which is um, what we call it, where there it has to maintain a certain staking rate in order for things in this world to continue happening. So it powers the mm. rest of the world. And then this can be very important when we introduce land, because you actually have to like terraform the land and like put a certain amount of magic and stake it for it to kind of like, um, you know, be um, habitable. Yeah. Um, so, so magic turns on the treasures and then the treasures are used to earn more magic is basically how it works. And it, so you said there needs to be a certain amount of magic staked for right. the mine to continue to emit new magic tokens. Is that right? Exactly. So if the staking rate okay. falls um, falls too far, then the mine uh, doesn't release magic anymore. And then the more that okay. people together are staking in it, like the total amount of emissions goes up. And that lets yeah. us control for like negative market spirals, basically. I see. And what would be the, 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 the flywheel effect that would bring... Um, yeah, bring more people to stake more magic again if if the staking rate falls too far down? Is it just because magic would be quite cheap and it would, again, make sense to... Like some people would start betting on, on its rise again and stake it? Or Yeah, and it has utility across all these worlds. So like the partners... Or, or the Yeah, the, the projects that we partner with are building out um, utility. So it functions... Um, in the world, like in the same way where they power treasures and then they power 
exploration. Um, we want to bring in more and more projects that like see um, the value in this design, which is that through the marketplace, we generate enough money to make the Freemint model sustainable. So we are actually like paying game developers and um, community storytellers to just to, to avoid the paid mint model. Just we will finance you up front to do your thing and then get your community going and then like we'll recoup it through royalties. Um, so, you know, eventually magic will be become, if this succeeds, so increasingly scarce that like the decision to restake isn't really about bridge world. It's, it's about all the partner projects. And then also the, you know, magic is the revenue revenue token for um, all of our infrastructure. So Trove, like all of the fees we earn in ETH, you will have to be staked. You have to have your magic staked in the mind to earn that. So, um, you know, if, at the point where treasure is like a very profitable thing, minus the metaverse, like you won't want to continue staking. Makes sense. Wow, it's it's such an elaborate system. I um I feel like you really need to do this full time or go home. Um, <laughs> because I mean I, I I'm not a like I was never a gamer, so maybe that's right. just my perception. But um, it it I can imagine it it takes some time and like all the people that I know that are in into this they're really like spending half the day at least uh, mm -hmm. in this ecosystem and um, w when you talk about this this all vision uh, this this vision with land and um, you know small brains interacting with the bridge world uh, so this this for those that don't know this this other second game that we're gonna get to in a bit uh, interacting with this one do you imagine it still as yeah more more like a resource game uh, like a board game where you just you know yeah send them on a simple operation or do you are we really speaking about video games at some point where you know 3d where you walk around with your characters and so on um or or do you imagine it more remaining similar to this experience um no there will be a game and we're going to announce soon like who the who the um It's actually going to be a DAO of um, developers that are helping us work on it. We're super excited to announce that. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a very polished, so you know, something that you would recognize in a commercial sense sort of game. And then the the rest of this, the meta game, will sort of just be something that crypto natives play. But I mean, the goal is we're going to make the best game we can. But also, the the meta game isn't tied to the success of that piece of the franchise. So, hopefully, whatever Bridge World is and Treasure, it it long outlives gameplay for. Our niche things amazing and um yeah let's maybe go to the small verse this is i don't know for some reason my my favorite uh project yeah i really love this the, the design of these uh small brains but yeah here and i think this this was launched yesterday that you could stake your your small brains these little monkeys before that you could also yeah already stake them and earn iq token uh, like not tokens but just iq points that would grow the the head size of these small brains and now right. you could since recently you can stake them and they are also earning yeah treasures right is, is that right. correct small or what, what are they exactly yeah. earning here yeah like uh, moon rock and different kinds of other um you know space resources because they're they're on their way to smallville which will have like um more earth-like resources so um, you know, these will end up being like the stores of value in my mind over the long term. And so these treasures, are those the same NFTs, resources that are also being used in, in Bridge World or are they different and, and only usable within this ecosystem? They're local, um, but okay. we, want to inter we want to see how far we can push the idea of fungibility between these metaverses. Like there, eventually there'll be exchange rates for these things and we're, and we're going to make sure that like, Treasures are applicable in different worlds. Like, so not only can you just exchange them for a bridge world resource, but you can actually use small resources in bridge world and vice versa. And here for small brain, is there also like a commercial game planned or is that is a vision there that it will eventually merge with, with the bridge world? No, it's going to be its own thing. So, okay. you know, this has kind of just gone beyond my wildest dreams. It was like a really stupid idea I had. The day later, I was still laughing at it and told, a couple friends and they're like, yeah, okay, that's, so I was like, okay, this is gonna be a growth strategy for the marketplace because we didn't have any inventory. And I was like, this thing could potentially go viral because it's so ridiculous and then no larger plans. And then what ended up, what ended up happening was like um, the community came in and we asked them, what should this thing be? 
And it was pretty obvious that it, it should be something like Animal Crossing or Stardew Valley, where it's an actual place. So the way small brains works is you stake small and then its IQ goes up and its head gets bigger. And then as more people do this, the public land is adding a new technology every day. So like it's through the through group participation of the world advances. And so we're going to do this at a much bigger level now. When they go to Smallville, they'll have their private land and it can change in a lot of ways and it'll be really cool. We have like multiple artists working on this. And then the public land will also be the same thing. That is more people play. And then you can like, you can stake on particular monuments and buildings to like, to help it advance. But so we had that idea. And then what ended up happening later was like on Twitter, there's all this amazing community art, like 3D and um, Commonopoly, um, who's actually going to be mm. releasing a collection for Treasure um, pretty soon. I'm super excited uh, to let him announce. So we learned from Magic that like if you make your own native money, it really bootstraps the DAO because the DAO gets to keep a lot of it. And then they say like whatever we make, if it has value, it's reflected in this thing. So mm. if you work hard, then you have money that you can spend to, to power other builders. So what Smallville mm -hmm. is going to power is the community of artists who are doing this for free. We saved a lot for giveaways to like incentivize them. And then it just kept mounting. So Smallville will really be a composable metaverse where we'll make it as easy as we can for other artists to come and like make items that can be plugged into it or derivatives. So we've, we're working very hard on a system to make it so you can have like custom characters that run around. So just, and then in the same idea as treasure, get out of the way of the community as fast as possible. Just give them the tooling to build out a little world and see what happens. Amazing. I, um, I really dig the vision. So it's, it's, is it a, fair to say it's a bit like human history where they sort of become smarter through evolution. And then as they become smarter collectively, they, The, the world in which they live is being upgraded. Exactly. Or, yeah. uh, arguably, m m some would say we're downgrading the world, but uh, yeah, right. sort of, sort of similar. Yeah. Okay. So, cool. So there'll be historical periods. It'll start prehistoric, and then after enough buildings have been added and the staking rate stays high enough, like the whole map will flip to a more modern version. Yeah. How involved are you in in both of these games, for example? Is there one of them that that you're more into for some reasons, um, and and more hand off from the other or are you helping craft all these um narratives and lores oh bridge world i'm i'm uh i've contributed them as much as i can like and who i mentioned this is and Taya, he's the artist uh, behind that painting but he also helped with a lot of game design and then we have Peter. And Peter has a phd in economics and worked in finance for a long time and then uh, saw our founder's vision paper randomly came to work for us. And that's pretty much the dream team. They just figure out Bridgeworld all day. And I work on uh, Smallville with Pixel Matt, who's the, the artist, and then uh, Maxime, who's our animator. And, you know, the amazing thing is every person I just listed came to the community and just started volunteering until we found enough money to hire them full time. And they left their corporate job. Mm -hmm. They all left like great, great gigs to go into the uncertainty of Web3. It's been a dream. And how are you guys all working together? Can I imagine, is this like a DAO where, you know, everything happens left and right, no coordination? Why are you, you know, having stand-ups? Because I know you, you, you raise some money now, it's getting serious. Like right. what, 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 of, what does the organization look like behind the scenes? It's much more structured now. So at the beginning, it was just whatever treasure was. And so we were all working on the same thing. And then small brain started as this growth strategy, but then it started to demand uh, more people. And we still had a commune like um, relationship at that point, you know, and uh, that's a great thing about, I think we have five artists who work for us full time and they're all amazing and, and, and like multi-talented. They don't, you know, they all can do pixel art. They all can do painting. Um, so we borrow resources. Um, but at a certain point when we were like trying to map out the project, particularly how many time zone differences there are, it was clear that we needed to bring in more structure. Um, so we brought in Jumpman, uh, Jumpman NFT from Twitter. He has a corporate background. And so the project managers we're hiring are not crypto natives. They've worked at places like Google and Amazon and bring in like a, a level of professionalism we really need to like, yeah, to, to, to scale now. Lastly, um, There's the, the battle. I mean, there's, yeah, as you mentioned, Jumpman with Seed of Life. I feel like we could uh, talk another five minutes about that one. But yeah. um, maybe I would just like to talk um, about Battlefly because I, I think that there's a lot of excitement around that one, especially because it's 30,000 NFTs. So it's, it's much larger and, and it's going to be 
more inclusive, again, a free mint. And I know for a fact that the team is putting a lot of care in that it really gets distributed to, to new people, brings new people into the ecosystem. So what can, can you give us some insights into the, the game there? So Ben Beef is behind Battlefly, and I just wanted to give him uh, a shout out. So he's one of our earliest community members. Um, I think I think in real life, he was ex- he was a successful businessman and sold some of his health companies and then became you know independently wealthy from that and then just became sort of like a crypt crypto investor. He's been here from the beginning. And even like when the, the project was at its most demoralized moment, when our market cap went down to like $300,000, I mean, he, he was willing to cut a check for us for the entire market cap to keep us going because he believed in it so much. And we had nothing to offer him, so we couldn't take it. But I, I just try and mention that as, as often as I can, because I think that's incredibly rare in crypto. Yeah. I mean, you know, all of us are here to protect our capital, but he really believed in this idea so much he was willing to help us at our um, darkest moment. And then he came along with Battlefly and the plan was always that if treasure does well, then the NFTs will get out of people's price ranges, which ended up happening mm-hmm. way faster than we thought. So there needs to be like an on-ramp and Battlefly allows people with less capital to get into the magic ecosystem. And it's also just an excellent proof of concept where you have someone um, in the community, but not on the treasure team who's using magic as this um, resource. And um, yeah, Ben has brought so much to the table. We can't fully announce yet, like all the ways that Battlefly has really changed um, the internal treasure organization, but it's super exciting. Like, yeah, he's done he's done an excellent job and they built it really fast too. I heard or well, yeah, read from, from a Twitter thread, the, the rough idea at the beginning is that these uh, butterflies or battleflies as they're called are um, you can send them on like a duel with some other battlefly and you have actually magic at stake when they right. uh, start a fight and then the winner gets yeah the the honeypot basically is, is that exactly. the, the gist of it right it's kind of like an auto battler i think i mean, i didn't really play games I, I don't know if i'm using the right word but it's like an arena where the battleflies are flying around and then they'll get kind of pulled down to a duel the winner yeah like gets magic and people can bet on it and there'll be also missions coming from battlefly itself to like sort of bootstrap the game um, but the neat thing too is that these aren't intended to last forever you know they're they're battleflies they have a very short lifespan um, and they're not going to get super expensive which is a rare thing in nfts and uh, yeah. It could be a really cool, a cool way to bring in a whole, like a, in a mass amount of people. Yeah. So you're basically incentivized to not be like a hoarder that just gambles on the price of the NFT going up. You, if you want to maximize the value of, of your butterfly, you need to play and like battle the, like the more you can exactly. in order to uh, yeah, gain magic tokens. Because yeah, if you don't use it, it will die at some point. And exactly. Uh, yeah. Use it. Which was our whole thesis from the beginning was that like you can slap a price tag on an NFT when you uh, at mint, but that doesn't like give it value. Like you should give it away for free and see what people build with it. And through the through the cost of their labor, then it it content it builds value. And Battlefly is a great example of that. Prices will stay stay smaller, but it is a demonstration that like you create value through work. Very exciting. And um, is the mint date public there or uh, is it known yet? Or I, I've I'm embarrassed tried to, to find I don't it. Know. There's so many. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, too much, too much going on. Easy. I finally want to talk about the other part of the, the treasure DAO, the Trove marketplace. Yeah. So this is in contrast to these games uh, that we've discussed that are really all sort of tied together by by magic. And then you have Trove, which is an upcoming NFT marketplace, much right. more compar- um, comparable to, to OpenSea, where anyone can just yeah, come and launch their PFP project or whatever it is. Right. And will this, for example, be priced in magic as well or Mm -mm. okay so this will be using ETH. okay so that's already one clear distinction between these two right exactly yeah Yeah. it's uh so it started where so the treasure marketplace is a very specific function which is to like bring in projects that use magic in their world and um their storytelling magic is directly tied into it it's a utility token and it, it functions as money if they can fit that specific vision and like we see that they have um, a long-term vision, then like we want to we want to pull them into there. And then there's a lot of like excellent NFT projects that don't, you know, don't fit that mold. Um, and we want to 
put we want to have a place for them, which is on Trove. Um, because you know what ended up happening with Magic was the mac the market cap went up so high, our treasury was worth so much that we could start investing in like all kinds of builders to make infrastructure that wasn't related to our initial goal. But um, you know, I, I, I say it kind of like a, it looks like a locomotive now, where it's gathering so much energy and continues to go faster and powering all these things. So we're like, let's just build out all kinds of infrastructure. And so Trove will be, we're, it'll be heavily curated. So we only want to bring in projects that like, we think that the builders um, want to do right by their community. So it's never going to be as large as OpenSea, but uh, it's going to be very diverse in its function. And also just like be sort of blunt is there's, we've been approached by a lot of projects that use magic, uh, quote unquote, and they're like, quote unquote, invested in the long term, but like, uh, you know, it's so important for a DAO in its infancy to control who is getting the native token. There have been a couple of times where people have approached us with blatant scams because they're trying to OTC a token with incredibly low float and um, doing a free mint on our marketplace way to do that. So, so Trove is sort of like a, a testing ground to see if these builders yeah. actually want to stick with us. Is the um, goal of these builders that are yeah, claiming to to use magic uh, or yeah, sort of that are affiliated with magic uh, is their goal to to get magic from the treasure DAO or is it just to be vetted as like an official magic project and therefore get a lot of buyers from the get-go because people know whatever you know whatever ma magic project launches has like reaches a good floor price like uh, if you look at smalls and, and lesions and so on and so they want to Right on that narrative, or is, is it just to yeah get get something from the treasury? Um, I, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. I don't know if it's uh, what it was. Maybe it seemed more yeah like um you know because that's so anyway. I mean, Beanie is not the best actor in the space, and he posted like yesterday with this like because you if you can if you have a native token and a collection that uses it, then you can make both of them go up at the same time. So there's like a huge financial incentive to use this for short term goals that I didn't see coming. But um, so now that we're aware that this is a thing, we, we're trying to be very deliberate about like who we partner with. Yeah, let's talk more about uh, Trove. Like um, what are its USPs, for example? Is it still the, f will it be the first marketplace on, and a general purpose marketplace on, on Arbitrum? Is there um, any at the moment? Yeah, um, Puddle, um, shoot, what's the name of that one? Puddle something. Okay, some uh, smaller one. Smaller one, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Trove will be, um, so it'll be um, much bigger, still curated, but we're going to offer like an experience that's different than OpenSea's. So OpenSea, they have a lot of things where like, okay, an obvious example, their search function doesn't even seem to work. I have to Google a collection because when I type the collection to the search bar, it like doesn't even show up, which is um, like their, their UX is approaching um, unusable and it's a sterile website, you know, and I guess maybe some people like that because it draws attention to the art. Um, but, you know, there just isn't had, you know, we are, a, we are advancing, a, you know, a particular idea, which is that decentralization can have forms of centralization. It can have curation. It can have DAO leadership. It's like very focused on the goal, but they are the ones making the decision and the DAO has to remove them to do otherwise. That also confers authenticity to it because there are real people making decisions to try and bring a community together. So we want to have like galleries, collections that do well, can continue to reward their community with like special um, galleries. And then, um, so that's like an incentive to, to do more. And then we're also like, we're doing some sort of unique incentives. A former co-founder uh, came up with a, this graveyard idea. So, you know, on OpenSea, all of your... NFTs that go to zero, just sit in your wallet forever. And we were like, or, you know, he, he came up with this idea. It was really good. It was like, why don't we just like make them grayed out and they go into the graveyard once they've gone to zero and you can play this like slot machine game to, you know, to try and generate a treasure or magic or, or, you know, a rare or like a small brain or something. Um, so to just kind of keep purging the inventory of its worthless items. That's amazing. So in the worst case, you can always use your NFT as a lottery ticket to gain a, a valuable NFT. Right. So do a little tax harvesting and hopefully get something. And these uh, prizes, they come out of the, the treasury that still has a supply of, of small brains from the, from the beginning? Um, or does it occasionally buy some new ones? Uh, we're, so we, we haven't started buying new ones. and But I personally think that this is something that 
you know, we shouldn't like the Dow shouldn't like pump the floor, but maybe replenishing its treasury isn't a bad idea because that's like a user user attraction strategy. But, Store um, value. Yeah, but the so 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 the whitelist like wasn't wasn't highly utilized for small brains. So we we gave people a long time, and then we just ended up with like an ample amount of the inventory to continue using for giveaways, which has been great. Very excited for for Trove as well. I applied personally with uh, yeah, I have yeah. like these crypto tests NFTs that are coming that will be like a a ticket into the community and let's see let's see how how that goes but in any That's case awesome. i love L, um yeah l2 nfts uh, and you're, you're playing a, a huge part in getting adoption there what what are your views on yeah l2 nfts I, i can assume you're bullish but um yeah do you do you think we will see like all l2, uh, like all nft activity shift from l1 to l2 in you know the medium term or do you think there's like use cases where yeah collections will s still launch on l1 because uh, they don't care of the, you know about, about the high gas prices since the yeah the, the mint price is high enough anyway what, what what do you think the space will look like in in six months i don't think that l1 will continue to survive i mean in this you know cosmos calls it the interchain future where things like are will kind of change a lot particularly with like DeFi utilizing nfts it'll be less about i just don't see the the bull case for l1 unless like people continue doing it and then you have like mm -hmm. very sophisticated DeFi products on l1 that use these things as collateral but i'm not even convinced that like nft DeFi is going to work out the way people have been talking about it like we've been trying for a couple of years to make these things fungible it doesn't really seem mm -hmm. to be working you know nftx mm. is an awesome organization they put yeah. some products out but like um mm. that's very difficult to build a yeah. um blending protocol with these things mm. that would rival you know what ave has made um yeah. so maybe like maybe DeFi's it has a very simple uh usage in nfts like a rental market so we're building out like um derivative rentals for nfts um in smallville you know and that's not a sophisticated lending protocol but i think it'll get way more adoption than like this oh i'm gonna lend my punk and trading and I i'm not sure that's the future i think the nftx model works well for maybe yeah, the top one or two collections because they have very high market caps and and then it makes kind of sense but then for like any long tail collection and there's almost no liquidity right. and um yeah, yeah. And I think the NFTX DAO has like a lot of punks themselves, which they have added into the into the vaults to yeah, bootstrap liquidity cool. for them. But any any others agree that doesn't really work. Yeah, super cool. And um, last question: I saw on Twitter you were mentioning uh, Magic having its own chain at some point. Yeah, uh, was that just shit posting, or is there some uh, sense of truth in the, in that? No, that's that's definitely true. I mean, you know, I work for Cosmos or Osmosis during the day, which is a Cosmos chain. Um, and I really believe that people are going to see that like you can you can spin up chains very easily. And then Osmosis, um, in Sonny's words, is like a bet on vertical accumulation. And the idea is that like it's not going to make sense in a few years to continue on blockchains where your product is going to be slowed down by um, congestion in in an ecosystem that's completely unrelated to yours. Like the idea that NFTs and DeFi and all these other things are just competing for the same, they're all driving each other's um, gas costs up doesn't, mm. doesn't make a lot of sense. And in Cosmos, you can have um, a chain where you can uh, transfer assets using um, IBC, like um, pretty a, a very frictionless way, but the chain itself like um, can run extremely quickly. It's very secure. And you can also do like really, really neat stuff at the consensus level. So um, in Ethereum, it's impossible to build a native front running solution um, into the consensus because you know validation is, is selecting um, random people. Whereas in Cosmos, you can go around in a circle and everyone just agrees about that current block. So you can, you can validate an encrypted block. And then on the next block, the first thing you do is that you decrypt the previous block and then you approve um, the next block. So this to me has a massive gaming application because if a guild can just see in the mempool what the other guild is going to do, then well, gas costs, you know, gas wars will continue and it also just destroys the fun of the game. So there has to be some like Osmosis calls it threshold decryption. But you know, that's the tip of the iceberg. Cosmos can do stuff where you don't have to use the staking token. The native token is staking. You could use any token. Um, you can use LP tokens um, as long as uh, governance agrees that there's Um, a baseline of um, security to it. 
And uh, you don't have to even pay gas in the native token. You could pay in any token that they uh, approve. So, I mean, you know, once people see that Cosmos is a uh, way more degen than Ethereum, I I'm not sure that, you know, uh, they'll just run rampant over L ETH L2s, in my opinion. But the marketplace, though, is will stay on Arbitrum because because there is too much cultural history of NFTs on Ethereum. I think that that's going to it's going to be hard to override. Nice. We, we agree on that for sure. Cool. Thanks so much for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, thanks. And, yeah, let's stay in touch. All right. Okay. Thanks. Have a good one.